Welcome back to our next panel. I will be moderating this panel. My name is uh, Pavitra Govindan. I am assistant professor of economics at the University of Utah. And uh, before coming here, I got my PhD from Brown uh, in 2018. And well, before I started my whole economics journey, I was an electrical engineer, and after which I worked in the intellectual property area. So I'm somewhat related to uh, law and economics, but not that much. Um, so I'm a behavioral economist. That is, I study individual behavior from the lens of psychology and economics. I study how individuals and firms deviate systematically from rationality assumptions made in neoclassical economics. And the systematic deviation in behavior from rationality is one of the critique of uh, traditional antitrust economics that believes perfectly rational individual and firm behavior on average. So there have been several papers in behavioral economics uh, or actually in antitrust economics that have used uh, behavioral economics as a way to critique the assumptions in antitrust. Uh, Carl Shapiro and Morris Stuck have written on this and hopefully this will be a future topic uh, in antitrust conferences. So in this panel today, we will be critiquing the current antitrust economics from different angles and propose potential directions one could go from here. So what we'll do is hear from each of the three panelists first, then we'll uh, listen to the views of two discussants and then give opportunity to our panelists to uh, respond to that and then we'll get to your reactions and questions. So we have uh, distinguished panelists and discussants today. Our first panelist is Professor Mark Glick. He is a professor of economics and an adjunct professor of law at the University of Utah. Professor Glick is a graduate of the New School for Social Research and Columbia University Law School. He practiced antitrust law in both New York and Utah. He's the author of numerous papers on antitrust and law and economics issues. His most recent paper is about how Chicago economics distorts consumer welfare in antitrust. Uh, and the next speaker would be Marshall Steinbaum, who graduated from University of Chicago in 2014. And um, I'm lucky to have him as a colleague uh, at the University of Utah. He studies market power in labor markets and its policy implications. His work has appeared in various journals, including the Journal of Economic Literature, University of Chicago Law Review, Industrial and Labor Relations Review. And uh, our last panelist today will be uh, Mark Jarsulik. He is the Senior Vice President for Economic Policy at American Progress. He has practiced antitrust and securities law at the FTC, Securities and Exchange Commission, and in private practice. Before coming to Washington, he was Professor of Economics at the University of Notre Dame. He earned an Economics PhD at University of Pennsylvania, and has a JD from the University of Michigan. So these are our panelists, and uh, we also have two discussants. Our first discussant is Gregory Adams. Greg is vice president in the competition practice at Charles River Associates. He has provided expert analysis and testimony in a wide range of areas, including antitrust, lost profits, and intellectual property. He received his PhD in economics from UC Berkeley. And last but not the least is our second discussant, uh, James Curl, who is a professor of economics at Brigham Young University. He is also a senior consultant for Charles River Associates. He has been involved in numerous antitrust cases as an economic expert and lectures on antitrust topics. Uh, Professor Curl earned his PhD in economics from MIT and completed a postdoc in law at the Harvard Law School. So we are very lucky to have our distinguished panelists and discussants here to talk about the economic challenges to traditional antitrust economics. And the way we'll proceed in this panel is slightly different from what we saw in the previous one. 
So we will have our panelists talk about their views, their papers in this field for about uh, 20 minutes each. And then we will give uh, the discussants to uh, comment about these papers. Okay, so first I invite uh, Professor Mark Glick for his uh, talk. Okay, thank you very much, Pavitra. Um, I want to begin my presentation by saying that economists have made great contributions to our knowledge um, about competition and antitrust, and I expect that they're going to do so even further in the future. However, in this presentation, I want to argue that antitrust economists should jettison the consumer welfare goal for antitrust. Okay? And although there are many reasons to do this, um, I want to focus on just two reasons today. The first reason is that the consumer welfare standard is based on unsound economics. Um, it's in conflict with modern uh, welfare economics as, as understood by economists today. And secondly, there's no evidence that the Chicago School assumptions and policies about efficiency have benefited the macro economy. So those are going to be my two reasons. So to start with, you heard in the first panel that the consumer welfare standard really today means different things to different people. So I want to begin with the origin story, with the very beginning, and explain to you um, what, what was meant by consumer welfare and why it's in conflict with economic theory. So the, the origin is chapter four of Judge Bork's book, The Antitrust Paradox. And what Judge Bork did in chapter four, of course he was following others, as was stated um, earlier today, you know, Aaron Director and many others. But in chapter four, he drew the traditional graph of consumer surplus from Alfred Marshall's 1890 Principles of Economics text. And that graph is reproduced in virtually every microeconomic class, introductory microeconomic class across the country. And I've taught it for you know, 30 years here at the University of Utah. Okay, so um, what he did is he started with that graph and then he redefined the word consumer surplus to mean consumer welfare. And so let me begin with, oh, it's up. So I'm going to be, begin with that graph. And um, I'm not going to talk about, there are some ambiguities about um, what, what, George, uh, what um, Judge Bork meant when he said consumer welfare, but I'm going to try to give you the consistent story. So here's the graph. And so you can see at the top is the demand curve. And this is for a single consumer and it's in a competitive market. And on the demand curve, you can read off how much money the single consumer is willing to pay for each unit of the good at issue. Okay, and this is supposed to represent the utility of the consumer. And by utility, we mean the expected satisfaction that the, that the consumer is gonna obtain from consuming the good as, as subjectively uh, understood by the consumer he or him or herself. So, okay. So, however, notice that you also have a competitive price that's PC and a competitive output QC. The, con the consumer may value the, the uh, product at the amount that's on the demand curve, but they only have to pay the competitive price. The difference is the consumer's welfare, according to Judge Bork. Okay? And then Judge Bork refers to efficiency as the process of making that triangle, that area of consumer welfare, as large as possible. This is the point where he gets a little bit confused, but let's stick to, let's stick to that and make it consistent. So efficiency for Judge Bork is the maximum utility. Okay, so notice if you lower the price, the output increases automatically. All my students know that and the consumer welfare area gets bigger. So Judge Bork thought that this should be the sole basis for antitrust. The focus should be lower price and higher output. Nothing else, according to the original Chicago School folks, was justified by economics. Okay, 
at first glance, you know, this seems like a very powerful argument. Because unlike the other traditional goals at the time, like supporting democracy or small business, you don't have to justify the goal any further. For example, take small business. You, you, if, if you say small business, uh, um, the goal of antitrust is to protect small business, then you have to ask the further question, well, why do we care about small business? But it, that's not true for lower price and higher output. It's good because it leads to greater consumer welfare. The ethical theories embedded in the economics, it justifies itself. And in recent articles, this is sort of the critique of the new Brandeis goals. The, the, the critique goes something like this. Okay, we know price and output are justified, but the new Brandeis folks, they don't provide a justification for their goals. I'm waiting for their justification. That's, for instance, Herb Havenkamp's uh, critique of of, of the new Brandeis goals. Okay, but there's problems from the start. Even when we consider the single individual, the moment the consumer makes the first purchase, his or her income changes. And so the willingness to pay for the next, the next unit of output is not gonna be on the demand curve. So in the 1930s, John Hicks famously tried to solve this problem by introducing the concepts of compensating and equivalent variation. And what he did is produce a more accurate representation of willingness to pay for each unit one by one as income changes. And at the same time, he produced the second graph, which is the um, willingness to accept. So you wind up with two separate graphs, uh, two separate graphs, and the Marshallian demand curve, that's this one, is somewhere in between. And then in a very famous article, Bobby Willig, who's an antitrust economist, of, of, uh, pretty, he's pretty famous, he was assistant attorney general um, during the Reagan years. Um, in a famous article, Consumer Surplus Without Apology, tried to bound the relationship between what Hicks was showing, which was the willingness to pay and willingness to accept, and the Marshallian demand curve, which is used by Judge Bork, he does so only for small price changes. So if we're talking about a durable good, like a, a, a large appliance or something, the difference can still be unbounded. Okay, but um, that's a little beside the point because I wanna spot Judge Bork, the individual consumer surplus or the individual consumer welfare graph. And that's because antitrust is really not about the individual. It's about markets and how business strategy impacts markets. The key issue in every antitrust case at the, at the beginning of the case is gonna be the definition of the relevant market. And in the Sherman Act itself, it talks about line of commerce and line of commerce is interpreted as a market. So how do we get from the individual consumer surplus to the market consumer surplus? Okay, so this is, I'm still at the level of like chapter two of my microeconomics class. And so what we do is we sum the individual uh, demand curves. And so you'll see um, here's individual one, individual two, and then you sum horizontally and you get the market. So for the first individual at a price of 10, they demand two units. The second individual at a price of 10 is three, and then at the market at $10, uh, there's five units of demand, okay? And you can see, um, this is not drawn very nicely um, because of my lack of PowerPoint skills, but if, if you can see that in the last market demand, um, you can see you still have that triangle, which is the consumer surplus or the consumer welfare, okay? But is that triangle meaningful in any way is the question at the market level. And the answer is no, because not without a further assumption. And that's because you can't add utility functions. Technically, utility functions are ordinal, this is for the econ folks, and they can't be added together and get anything meaningful, okay? So we need another assumption. And the only way that we can get market uh, consumer surplus or consumer welfare to have any meaning 
is to assume that a dollar for each consumer measures the same amount of utility. Or put simply, a dollar is a dollar for everybody. That's the assumption that we need. So here's the problem. We know that's a false assumption. Uh, and I'll give you three reasons. The first is common sense. A uh, hundred dollars to Bill Gates is worth less utility than a hundred dollars to somebody who's homeless on State Street, downtown Utah, and is starving. Okay? It's just common sense that there's a difference in utility per dollar. Let me give you a second reason. If a dollar was a dollar to everybody, there can't be risk aversion. Financial theory is built on the assumption that the marginal utility of money declines as wealth increases. So if a dollar were a dollar to everybody, corporations wouldn't have to pay investors more to hold stocks than hold bonds. We know that risk aversion is an, is, is an observable fact. So a dollar, and so therefore we know, or we can infer that a dollar is not a dollar to everybody. Third, no economist believes a dollar is a dollar to everybody. I, I hope not. I'm going to ask that question of the other panelists, but I hope that's the case. <laughs> Early on in 1914, this prompted Alfredo Pareto to abandon Marshall's consumer surplus theory and develop the concept of Pareto efficiency. And almost every economist um, at the time and after followed suit. So Pareto, Pareto argued that the only thing that economists can say about efficiency is that, is that if one person is made better off by a policy and no one is made worse off, then the change is efficient. Okay? And you can think of this sort of as a theory of unanimous consent, because if there's no jealousy, then everyone would agree to the change, and, and that made it efficient. And my reading of modern welfare economics is that this is the only consistent definition of um, of efficiency. And let me read you from a quotation from Angus Deaton, who's one of the world's foremost um, welfare economists, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1950, nine, uh, 2015. I'm, I'm still back with Pareto. 2015. <laughs> and this is a quote from the Handbook of Econometrics, and he says, there is no valid theoretical or practical reason forever integrating under a Marshallian demand curve. And put simply, what that means is consumer welfare, the consumer welfare at the market level is not justifiable. OK. So what this means is that absent uh, untrue assumption, there's, there is no justification for lower prices and higher output. There is no consumer welfare doesn't give you the justification that Judge, the Judge Bork wanted. Okay? It can only do this if you make an untrue assumption. Um, if the price change didn't harm anybody else, if there was a benefit because one consumer gets a lower price and nobody else is impacted, okay, then it might be Pareto efficient. But that's not likely to be the case because when price goes down, output goes up. And when output goes up, usually you need more inputs. And so it's unlikely. At least it's something that we don't know, and it's not the consumer welfare argument. Um, I want to make the argument to the law students and law professors that you have no obligation to accept an economic conclusion based on a questionable, and a, a questionable assumption. I mean, that's why we have Rule 702, the Rule of Evidence 702. Right, the Dalbert standard. I mean, you, you can't operate this way as a lawyer, for instance. Uh, you can't walk into the courtroom and say to the judge, look, I know the accident happened at noon on a Friday, but, but Your Honor, for purposes of my oral argument today, I'm going to assume that the accident occurred at night. <laughs> okay? that, that's, that's what essentially you're doing. Okay, so having said that, now consider the Williamson trade-off, which, which Judge Bork reproduces in Chapter 5 of the Antitrust Paradox. And that's this, this graph. And this is the graph, if you take any antitrust fundamentals class anywhere from the ABA antitrust section, or if you go to the antitrust section meeting uh, like I do every spring, a new crop of antitrust lawyers are introduced to this graph. <laughs> 
Okay, this is how, how lawyers are taught the economics of antitrust. And you can see you, this is the market demand, and this is so this is the like from slide two, here's the market demand. Now assume from slide two that all the firms merge to monopoly, and so you get PM, the monopoly price, PC was the competitive price, and you get with higher price, you get lower output, that's QM. QC is the competitive price, and now notice what happened. So you have smaller consumer surplus than you had under competition, right? You have um, some consumers that don't switch. They just pay the higher price. That's the monopoly profits. There are some consumers that switch. That's the deadweight loss because there's consumers that value the product at more than it costs us socially to produce it, yet it's not produced, so we call that dead weight loss. And then you have, um, since this is a merger to monopoly, you might have some synergies, and so marginal cost is lower. PC is also a marginal cost, so MC is the, is the lower marginal cost um, after the merger, and we call those efficiencies. And so I just want to make two points about this graph. The first is that moving from monopoly to competition is not Pareto efficient. Why not? Because the monopolist is a loser. In fact, Pareto efficiency doesn't apply ever in antitrust. Why? Because there's always a plaintiff and a defendant in the courtroom. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. So Pareto efficiency is not a concept. And this is the concept I understand that is endorsed and the only consistent concept of efficiency endorsed by today's welfare economists is not applicable to antitrust, okay? Um, however, uh, the move would be um, wealth maximizing or, or Caldor Hicks uh, efficient or potentially Pareto efficient. Those are all words that mean the same thing. The, the problem with that criteria is that after Samuelson's um, 1950 paper and Gorman's 1953 paper, um, almost everybody agrees that's, in, that's a very inconsistent criteria. Okay, the second point I want to make about this graph is even Judge Bork is switching gears when he says that the lower marginal costs are efficiencies. Because in Judge Bork's conception, efficiencies means more utility. But now I've switched to lower cost. But I, to know if that's efficient, I have to know where those costs come from. Suppose those costs come from some process like laying off workers or, or, or speed up of workers or some, some process like that. It could lower utility, right? It doesn't mean that we have higher utility because we have higher costs. It depends on the, how we get these costs. So that's, I think, that the, the whole idea of um, efficiencies and mergers is inconsistent with the consumer welfare uh, paradigm. And finally, recently there are some who have argued that we should retain the um, consumer welfare story because it has unleashed business efficiencies and we can see that in the macro economy. Okay? In my view, there's no evidence for this argument, so I want to show you some evidence. Okay, so what I did here is I compare, compared two periods. The period when we had more regulation, we had a regime, um, as Sandeep was talking about, there's sort of two regimes in the United States before and after 1980 um, with the transition in the late 70s. And there's, there's the end of the New Deal regulation, but there's also very strong antitrust enforcement. And then we get a sort of a transition and then from 1980 to 2015 is the period of neoliberalism with very, very uh, loose um, and, and less stringent antitrust enforcement. And look at the comparison. It's, it's kind of not what you would think, you know, just, just by listening to the news or, or reading The Economist magazine. So look at real GDP growth. In the early period, it's higher. In the neoliberal period, it's lower. The profit rate was higher, now it's lower. Labor productivity was higher, now it's lower. The real wage was higher, now it's lower. 
the unemployment rate was lower, now it's higher. Investment growth has dropped a ton. Uh, that's a significant development in, in, in recent decades, that investment is very, very low. I think part of the reason for that is that there's very little funds because of stock buybacks. And finally, as you know, inequality is much higher than it was. So my conclusion is that the consumer welfare standard is based on bad economics. There's no e empirical support for it, and it should be abandoned. OK, well, that was great. And uh, we'll wait for the discussant's critique of that. But before that, we'll have Marshall talking on this. Uh, thank you, Pavitra. Um, uh, and I should say that I, I kind of uh, pulled one over on the discussants because I didn't actually give them my paper before the panel. Um, so, so they'll have to come up with their devastating criticisms as I, as I reveal it to the world for the first time. Um, so I want to talk about what economics has taught us about market power. Um, and I'll set up the question by saying, does the United States economy have a market power problem? Um, even posing that question uh, invites controversy in the current debate, um, even before attempting to answer it uh, in, a f in factual terms. Um, we've been told that market power is too complex um, or too abstract of a phenomenon to study at such a broad and macroeconomic level, um, and that the answer can only be given to the answer to the question: Can the, does the economy have market power? Can only be given with respect to individual firms or markets, or at the widest possible extent, in some cases, um, at, at, to industries. Um, the absolute worst sin that it's possible to commit in an answer to that question um, is to answer it in reference to measured industry concentration. Supposedly, doing that uh, was a grave error of empirical industrial organization in the structuralist error in the structuralist era, um, an error an error that we now all agree should be permanently consigned to the dustbin of intellectual history. The danger in even asking the question about whether the economy suffers from a market power problem is that it invites a structuralist methodology to answer. And therefore, so this reasoning goes, uh, the question should not even be posed. Uh, this approach is flawed on a number of levels, from the abstract epistemological to straight up empirical uh, to the arbitrary confining of the policy space uh, to be not very different from what, the from what the policy currently is. First of all, if economics can't answer a question, uh, it can't answer such an important empirical question without making reference to a methodology that everyone in the profession um, agrees is flawed, then that's a problem for the methodological tools currently on offer, not a reason not to ask the factual question. Uh, second, it just isn't true that we have to rely on flawed methodologies to answer that question. Uh, in fact, good empirical research from inside and outside empirical industrial organization has shed light on it. And the fact that it's possible to characterize a broad finding in the affirmative across such a wide variety of fields, methodologies, data sources, and researchers should be an argument in favor of methodological pluralism. Uh, instead, the reaction has been one of defensiveness and insistence on tried and true methods, simply because those methods distinguish insiders from outsiders, a classic barrier to entry. And finally, when antitrust was in these supposedly bad old days of flawed structuralism, it was far more effective than it is now at regulating the set of business models available to the economy's largest and most powerful corporations. Uh, I think some of the facts that Mark laid out at the end of his, uh, of his paper shed light on that. Um, in fact, it was precisely because of the effectiveness of antitrust uh, in regulating those business models that the Chicago S School and ultimately the entire antitrust policy consensus turned against it. Uh, the stories told since then uh, is that antitrust was tamed by economists so as to, uh, to conform to economic principles uh, rather than the uh, mythological and coet populism of the past. Um, in fact, the antitrust policy against which the Chicago School directed its revolutionary campaign from above was itself highly economic, just not the kind of economics uh, the Chicago School preferred. Uh, Harold Demsetz, for example, famously pointed out that a positive relationship between firm profits and market concentration in a cross-section of industries might not uncover a causal relationship between uh, concentration and market power. Uh, and he was right about that. Uh, the alternative mechanism he put forward, though, um, says that efficient firms gain market share and also profit at the expense of less efficient rivals. Um, and that alternative theory that was put forward uh, as a critique of structuralism has never actually been shown to be correct. Uh, it's a good negative argument to wield at an economics seminar against a presenter's preferred interpretation of empirical findings, but it's not a positive empirical finding in itself, and is certainly not a good guide for policy. 
Uh, thus, it's not terribly surprising that in following that radical over-interpretation uh, over of an essentially theoretical point, antitrust policy went down a road to much greater permissiveness for market power and the uses to which it can be put by those who possess it. Uh, Demzetz's critique of structuralism is not the best known and probably, mo or, sorry, is only the best known and probably most general example of this, but in a plethora of more specific papers and cases, economics is presumed to consist of a narrow set of theoretical and frankly ideological assumptions that are never tested and upon which wild swings in policy have been based. We're doing economics differently now than we were when Debzetz made that point. Um, but, uh, and so it's, uh, a theory is not really enough anymore to dispute a set of well-established facts. Um, our contemporary kind of economics has shown that the revolution in antitrust inaugurated by the Chicago School was based on nothing of substance. In this presentation, I want to offer a more considered interpretation of the evidence we have to date about whether the economy suffers from a market power problem, one that does not dismiss empirical findings ex ante because they are discovered using methodologies, methodologies supposedly discredited on the basis of bad arguments 50 years ago. I contend that it is quite possible for us to answer this empirical question using the empirical tools that, economists, that economics has available to it right now. I answer the question in the affirmative. The economy does suffer from a market power problem, and the implication of that is that a series of radical policy changes whereby antitrust was trimmed back and denuded were undertaken in ignorance of basic, by which I mean empirical, economics, and that ought to be reversed. So how do we know that the economy suffers from the concentration of market power in the hands of incumbent firms and their wealthiest and most powerful stakeholders? Um, I'll discuss four uh, broad sets of facts that tell us this. First of all, uh, we have evidence of rising markups. Uh, for example, Deluker, Ikut, and Unger perform a production fu function estimation for the entire U.S. economy using a fairly parsimonious cost minimization approach and panel accounting data. Uh, they show a rising firm-weighted average markup over time. Others have shown that data sources, in particular what cost is assumed to be minimized and what data we have on those costs, uh, matters a lot to both the level and time trend of markups. It must also be noted that those authors' theory confines market power to the output market and assumes input markets, specifically labor markets, are competitive, and therefore that monopsonistic markdowns do not contribute to aggregate market power. More on that in a bit. Uh, Bruno Pellegrino constructs a more complicated model of interlinked sectors in the U.S. economy and shows a strong positive concentration profits relationship, where concentration in the markets he constructs indexes the network centrality of firms to the production process, i.e. market power. It's a novel theoretical and empirical contribution, but it is at its root re-excavating exactly the structuralism that was supposedly discredited 50 years ago, albeit using some of the tools of modern industrial organization. Uh, Simcha Barkai documents a rising profit share of GDP and declining labor and capital shares once the capital share is measured by the cost of capital, uh, which has been in long run decline, and not the return on capital. The difference between the two profits is the macroeconomic analog to the industrial organization concept of the markup. And finally, many authors have used accounting data to show a rising heterogeneity in firm level markups. Uh, all the aggregate action is accounted for by uh, outlier firms whose profits have increased substantially relative to the median firm. Uh, this too is a sign of market power. Uh, why doesn't entry discipline the returns available to the economy's most powerful and profitable actors? Uh, second, the, uh, as Mark mentioned, we have evidence of declining corporate investment. Um, one of the major puzzles in contemporary macroeconomics is this missing corporate investment given measures of firm level return on invested capital um, in the form of Tobin's Q, the ratio of the market value of a firm to the sum of its capital stock valued at cost. If firms are profitable, they are supposed to be investing to take advantage of these profitable opportunities. And if they are not, new entrants will take, if they're not investing, new entrants will take advantage of those opportunities to the point that the, at the margin, they, the return uh, on investment is driven to lower zero economic profits. High and rising uh, profits and stock market valuations for the economy's most profitable businesses can't possibly be consistent with antitrust policy success, and yet some economists have tried valiantly to rationalize them. Several authors have sought to explain the concentration of market power with reference to either rising fixed costs of entry, supposedly in the form of the development of software systems for inventory management or marketing, or to the advent of extremely productive super firms who are better able to outcompete their deadwood rivals. Both of these mechanisms are not consistent with the data. The rising fixed cost argument is belied by declining investment, and the super firm argument suggests that the economy should be characterized by greater efficiency and lower, not higher markups, as super firms gain market share. If that story were true, there should be a negative concentration profits relationship. Thus, by turning to the empirics and letting the data guide us, we can reject the two leading economic rationales for rising profits and greater, greater uh, market power. Third, uh, declining entrepreneurship and business dynamism. 
The fact of a multi-decade decline in the rate of formation of new businesses and the growth rate of new businesses is now well established in the, in the literature, thanks to the work of Decker, Haltwanger, uh, Jarman, and many co-authors, but its interpretation is not well understood or agreed upon. Uh, the Demzetsian view that rationalizes large firms gaining market share from small firms would see this as a positive development. Uh, but in a dynamic context, the implications for overall growth and innovation in the economy uh, uh, must may be profound. Indeed, the pattern of declining dynamism uh, uh, has transpired over decades, but it tends to follow the contour of the business model and uh, of the business cycle, and as Sarah Moreira has shown, to penalize those firms who lack access to effective demand early in their life cycles. The macroeconomic implications are that the demand has been systematically lacking, even in macroeconomic recoveries, and that has given rise to the overall aging distribution of firms. At the other end of what might be called the, uh, the firm life cycle, public offerings are down and privatizations are up, with the public equity market decreasingly a source of capital or a mechanism by which profits from old innovations are translated into investments in new ones. Uh, indeed, uh, instead, the public market has become a means by which insiders offload risk and bank their paper gains while retaining low total control. Once presented as a mechanism for democratizing corporate America, the public equity market is now enabling the unification of ownership with control that, it that, that once existed to separate. Uh, the bad economics behind that policy change is slightly different than the bad economics behind the decline of antitrust. Agency theory, which held that irresponsible executives act contrary to the interests of their shareholders, and so firms and the economy as a whole would be made more efficient the more executives could be made answerable solely to shareholders. And what better way to do that than to turn executives into shareholders? That concentration of power within firms has had a baleful impact on the concentration of power between firms and in the economy overall, as the literature on common ownership by a syndicate of powerful overlapping shareholders of all the firms in an oligopolized industry has shown. The idea that antitrust might care about the fate of small businesses, entrepreneurs, and their enterprises has been systematically denigrated since the 1970s on the theory that you can read the worthiness of firms right off their size distribution, and a policy that prioritizes entrepreneurship will penalize efficient firms and thus the economy as a whole to prop up inefficient ones. In fact, contemporary antitrust considers consolidation in the retail supply chain, for example, an overt policy success because, so the policy assumes, that generates low prices for consumers on the basis of efficiency in the process of production. The research on declining entrepreneurship, the aging firm distribution, and its relation, if any, to growth and innovation, puts the lie to the simplistic and Penglossian theory of which firms fail and which succeed. Uh, suddenly, an antitrust policy that has as its aim to, uh, to preserve competitive opportunities for small and medium-sized businesses doesn't look so crazy or economically illiterate once you remove the size equals virtue assumption uh, that in inherited from Demzetz and his colleagues. But while their philosophy has ruled the day, we've seen the virtual elimination of small business market share in agriculture, in retail, in tech, and in numerous other sectors where consolidation was assumed to be a sign of progress. And finally, uh, monopsony and employer power in labor markets. Um, it's been startling the degree to which the focus in empirical labor economics has shifted from workers and their characteristics to firms and markets when we seek to explain labor market outcomes like rising inequality and wage stagnation. Um, this reflects a critical sea change in the intellectual history of the subdiscipline, which for many years assumed that labor markets are competitive and that, work, and that workers in them are paid what they are worth. The evidence of rising inter-firm earnings inequality, grow, the growing wedge between measured labor productivity and pay, reduction in job-to-job -job and geographic mobility of workers, low and possibly falling estimated firm-specific labor supply elasticity of workers, declining frequency of outside job offers, flattening relationship between tenure and a single job and earnings in that job, and the use of outsourcing threats to discipline the wage demands of workers on the job all point to the reality that employers, not workers, set the terms and conditions of work. It's somewhat surprising that the impact of this burgeoning literature has been felt so strongly in antitrust, where other policy levers have historically been considered more relevant to the status and well-being of workers. But I can give some reason why this research has had such purchase in the antitrust debate, because when anyone who doesn't have a lifetime's experience enclosed in the antitrust establishment hears that when companies promise to lay off workers and ship their jobs overseas, that makes their merger more likely to be approved under the consumer welfare standard, pretty much anyone else would find that to be perverse. And notwithstanding a great deal of protest from the insiders, it is in fact the case that antitrust under the consumer welfare standard is hostile to worker bargaining power and seeks to reduce it. For example, in considering the law of vertical restraints in the early 1980s, leading economists inside and outside the antitrust enforcement agencies opined that removing restrictions on the control and direction powerful economic agents could exercise over their dependents was efficiency enhancing by increasing the productivity of those dependents. This formulation presumes that those dependents have outside options to which they could depart if what is really going on is that they are being made to earn less than the value of the stuff they produce. 
But of course, all the evidence on labor market monopsony shows that not to be the case. And as the legal status of, temp of statutory employment has receded and workers are separated legally further and further from the actual bosses who wield power over their terms and conditions of work, the relevance of antitrust policy, the set of policies governing power relations between arm's length economic entities, uh, becomes more important as labor regulations have failed and been undermined by the growth of the independent contractor classification and the ability of lead firms to segregate lower status workers into subordinate firms. A paper by Nathan Wilmers, for example, found that where suppliers are more exclusively dependent on a single buyer, the buyer is able to dictate price reductions that are passed along to workers in the form of lower pay. So to sum up, a great deal of evidence in support of the proposition that, a con that market power is endemic to the economy and the weakening of antitrust under the consumer welfare standard is, is significantly responsible for that. I want to close by returning to the methodological question. Is everything I've just finished discussing tainted by its association with methods that empirical industrial organization wis wisely gave up 50 years ago? Uh, the answer is quite obviously not. What it does reflect is that as empirical methods have sharpened in much more recent time, received wisdom about a perfectly competitive economy doling out to each factor and each worker exactly what he or she is worth have increasingly come under stress. The burgeoning literature on the economy's market power problem reflects methodological advances, not retrogression. But those who make their specialty in industrial organization feel themselves and their received wisdom to be under threat by the rising tide of empiricism that calls into question their received wisdom. So they dismiss all of this as redoing a methodology they discarded decades ago. It's not the most attractive look, and it also denies the role economists played in antitrust retreat and the consequent construction of the contemporary economy along lines that starkly reveal its absence. Antitrust policy has swung wildly in the past in response to changing eth economic methodologies and the changing standard assumptions about how the economy works. We now know those assumptions were false, and what preceded them was much closer to the mark. It's, not surpri it's no surprise that this sea change in policy coincided with a sea change in methodology. Now that empiricism is once again in the ascendance, and we can recognize that what happened in the Chicago Revolution was a move from theory directly to policy without stopping to check whether the theory was actually true, it's time to take a broad reconsideration of the antitrust policy landscape inherited from the prior generation. This is a lesson for policymakers, law lawyers, judges, and practitioners, but as far as I'm concerned, it's foremost a lesson for economists. Thank you, Marshall. Um, let's have Mark Jarsulik present now. Hello. Yeah, let me begin by uh, uh, thanking uh, Mark Lick and, and Marshall Steinbaum and Utah Bar and all the people who have organized this. Mike, yeah. Sorry. Can, can, can you hear me now? Okay. I, uh, okay. Uh, I want to begin by thanking uh, Mark and Marshall and the Utah Bar for organizing this conference. Uh, it's really been a superb experience being here. And what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just uh, walk through some of the highlights of uh, the paper uh, of this title uh, that is Antitrust Enforcement for the 21st Century and um, illustrate some of the major points from that paper. Um, the paper tries to make four main points, uh, which I think are, are uh, reasonably well established uh, by data. The first is that there's really good empirical evidence uh, that many publicly traded non-financial corporations are earning super competitive, super competitive rents uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and that the ability of corporations to earn rents has risen since the 80s. Um, second point is that this observation uh, uh, implies the existence of persistent barriers to entry, which means that there is lost efficiency and some substantial redistribution of income compared to a, a competitive outcome. Uh, the third point is that these barriers to entry, uh, aside from uh, existing because firms have exclusive uh, access to superior technology, uh, arise, the, these barriers also tend to arise from a, a mul multiplicity of sources, ranging from control of protected intellectual property uh, 
to network externalities, to the strategic use of mergers and acquisitions. Uh, and then as a consequence, it, it seems very unlikely that some single remedy So, someone has to tell me if... Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, so the, the implication of these multiple sources of barriers to entry uh, is that there's probably not going to be one simple single policy approach that's going to be able to handle them, even if antitrust is probably in itself going to be inadequate. But the fourth point is that uh, changes to merger enforcement policy uh, which are possible under current law, uh, could go a long way to addressing at least some of the issues that, we, uh, that appear in the data. So uh, let me first turn to the uh, empirical evidence of rents and where they're located. Um, in a competitive stock market, in a competitive market for equities, uh, the market value of a firm is going to be equal to the present value uh, of its net revenues. Uh, and if the market value is greater than the replacement cost of capital, then there's an arbitrage opportunity. That is, you could buy a unit of the capital that's being used by the firm to make its, its produce its goods or services and sell the right to the, to the uh, revenues from that capital in the equity markets and make, it, make a profit, right? So under no arbitrage, uh, the market value of the firm should be equal to its replacement cost correctly measured. Um, and so one of the, the measure we're going to use for the existence of rents is the ratio of market value to replacement cost. When the market value to replacement cost is equal, that is when the ratio, which is called the Q ratio, is equal to one, then the firm is earning competitive returns. But when, the, when this Q ratio exceeds one, the firm is earning rent in addition to competitive profit. And it's, it's possible to use that value to calculate the share of its returns, which are in fact rent. So if the value of Q is two, the You can't say that. <laughs> Whatever it is you were gonna say, you can't say that. <laughs> uh, half, the, half the net revenue is composed of rent. If the Q value is three, two thirds of the net revenue is composed of rent. So, Let's turn to uh, illustrations of some of the empirical evidence. Uh, in order to, to look at this problem, uh, I had the good fortune to convince a couple of financial economists who, who did very, a very careful study uh, of, uh, as part of a very careful study, measured Q values for individual firms, the entire, uh, the entire uh, set of individual firms in the CompuSet database for uh, a 40 year period from 1975 to 2015. And uh, when you look at, the, look at those data, which is a near census of non-financial corporations that are publicly traded, uh, one of the remarkable things that you see is that from the 70s through the contemporary period, there's a very large rise above the value of one, both of average Q for all the, all the firms that are uh, in, the, in that database, and in the 90th percentile value, right? So by 2015, although there are fluctuations over time, uh, the average value approximates two, uh, the 90th percentile value is something between two, two, and three, two and three. So it looks from these data that the ability of firms to uh, to gain rent is actually quite strong, quite persistent, and has risen over time. Now, it, it might be the case that, uh, or it could be argued that uh, these kinds of values are transient, that firms achieve them for some short period of time, but then they're competing away. And so one of the things we did was look at these data and calculate the likelihood that a firm that has a, a value of Q greater than one in, in year one has a Q value greater than one in year two. That is the, the transition probability uh, 
uh, we're looking at transition probabilities. And you see from this graph that the transition probability, uh, or the, the probability of staying with a, uh, a Q value greater than one has risen from about 10% in the 70s to something like 30% in the contemporary period. So not only have the average values been rising, uh, the ability of firms to maintain them over time has risen as well. Now, of course, not every firm has this advantage, and uh, what this figure has is a, uh, is a distribution of five-year averages of Q values by value for two periods, that is from 81 to 85 and 2011 to 2015, and what we see from this is there are a substantial number of firms who have Q values of one or below, right? Even by 2015, more than half the firms aren't earning rent of any kind. But over time, the distribution is shifting to the right, right? There are more firms that are earning uh, non-competitive returns, and there's a, there's a bigger, there's a growth in the right-hand tail of firms that are earning uh, substantially more. Uh, by way of rent. Uh, these, these data were um, um, truncated at, at 10 so that, so that uh, we could preserve the usefulness of the graph uh, so that there are some firms with, that are in this uh, graph that actually have uh, Q values greater than 10. We also took a look at, at the, uh, the distribution uh, among large firms uh, across industries to identify industries where rents uh, are particularly high. And so this graph is uh, by industry on the horizontal axis, and then within each industry, look at average values, average Q values for five-year intervals for the firms in those industries. And you'll see that uh, as we've arranged it, the high Q value industries are toward the bottom. So particularly healthcare, information technology, uh, communication services witness the highest average Q values for these periods. But it's not exclusively confined to those, right? In those, we've, in those uh, uh, sectors, intellectual property is really important, certainly in healthcare. Um, Certainly in, in information technology, uh, very important. Uh, and network externalities, clearly important in, in the communication services industry where there are uh, platforms and network externalities. But there are other sectors of the economy where uh, there are persistent high Q values uh, that, uh, for these large firms. Uh, for example, uh, consumer discretionary and consumer staples. Uh, consumer staples would be firms like uh, P&G, Philip Morris. Uh, consumer discretionary would be things like Starbucks. Uh, one, of the things that, that, one of the things that we see from these data is that some of the, uh, some of the firms uh, where people would expect rents to be occurring uh, aren't really experiencing it. So if you look toward the, the top of this list, um, where uh, energy firms are located, uh, most of those firms don't appear to be accumulating lots of rent by this standard. And so firms like Exxon, uh, which are kind of bet more, or bet more of some people, uh, aren't implicated by these data. Uh, and as, um, as I, was, I was looking through some of these data before coming here, um, it's also the case that by this standard, uh, the airline industry is, is not uh, accumulating uh, significant rent. So in the interest of time, I, I skip a slide here. So I, I think that the, uh, it's important to recognize that uh, if you accept this, this as uh, significant evidence of uh, functional barriers to industry which allow f firms to uh, accumulate rent, that the consequences are, are pretty significant. Uh, one, uh, these rents can in fact 
shift income in a major way. Uh, as a kind of back of the envelope calculation here, uh, I took the average Q value for non-financial corporations and assumed that it applied not only to the firms that are publicly traded, but to the non-traded firms. And looked at what that implied for uh, the share, for the actual aggregate value of profits that are or rent. And so for 2015, using that calculation, uh, the annual rent accumulation of uh, non-financial corporations would be $600 billion a year. So it's, uh, it's significant, it's not all of profits, uh, but it's certainly, uh, certainly a major upward transfer. Uh, I think the second uh, implication of uh, this evidence is there has to be, on a kind of fundamental level, a real decline in dynamic efficiency in the economy. I mean, one of the intuitions across most economic paradigms is that capital flows to the highest rate of return, right? And if capital is freely allowed to flow to areas where return is highest, returns converge, right? What these data are saying is capital isn't flowing to areas of highest return. It's not providing more supply where returns are really high. And as a consequence, we're not producing en enough of some things that would in fact uh, uh, be purchased and, and provide uh, a reasonable competitive rate of return to their suppliers. Okay, so that, that in that kind of fundamental area, or fundamental sense, there are real dynamic efficiency, inefficiencies here, and that they've been growing over time. Okay? Uh, and then I think a, a third consequence is that when firms are uh, recipients of large amounts of rent, uh, they both have uh, reasons and resources to engage in strategic behavior uh, to preserve it. And the consequence of that is that this situation uh, has an, uh, an endogenous mechanism that sustains it over time uh, and can, in fact, uh, become uh, significantly worse. So where are we at? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. So the, the paper does talk a little bit about uh, the potential sources of these barriers to entry. Um, one is the ability of firms to, to strategically uh, merge and acquire in order to uh, create barriers and eliminate competition. Uh, one example that uh, has really struck me as I look through some of this literature is the notion of killer acquisitions in pharmaceuticals. Right, pharmaceutical companies are already granted uh, intellectual property protection for the, for the things that they invent and they produce. Uh, but the, but the evidence from uh, uh, this paper by, uh, I think, Kathleen Cunningham at Stanford is that uh, firms which have existing drugs or existing therapies where there are relatively few competitors, where they're making uh, really significant returns, will often engage in acquisitions of potential competitor drugs that would reduce the returns of their existing drug and, and potentially take market share if they're developed by someone else. And once they acquire those drugs, the probability that those drugs will go through the subsequent stages of development that are required to bring them to the public declines dramatically. Okay? So that's a, uh, so it, it's pretty clear that you can use M&A strategically in that way. And there are other, other examples, I think people here have talked about Facebook's acquisitions. Um, Intellectual property uh, uh, in itself, of course, is, is a, um, uh, a really nice way of, of uh, setting up barriers to, co uh, to competition. And I think here the notion of patent thickets, which are sometimes uh, described as uh, obstacles to entry are important in high-tech manufacturing uh, and in, in other areas. Uh, if, you want to, if you want to start producing the product, you often have to confront the fact that many of the, of the components that you are working on 
or you want to work with already have some sort of intellectual property component that's owned by someone else. If you're going to maneuver your way through the, that ownership maze, the only way that you're going to do it successfully is if you yourself have a portfolio of patents that you can use as a negotiating tool with the people who have the patents that you need to access if, in fact, you're going to enter. And so there, there have been some really nice statistical sh studies to show that when these patent th thickets exist, the entry of people uh, without them uh, is slender and declines as the, as the, the thickets get, get bigger. Um, and I think a, a third, uh, third barrier is created, uh, created especially in digital industries um, by differential access to data. Uh, and I think the, the work of Posner and Weil and this is very, uh, very interesting because what they, what they suggest is that uh, in an area where, uh, say, in, in online advertising technology where access to data is crucial, firms that have successful siren servers like the Google search engine or Facebook's communication platform have an enormous volume of data that allows them uh, to understand consumer behavior in ways that people who don't have access to their siren server um, do. And the fact that they have this massive inflow of data allows them to engage in a kind of um, machine learning by doing, which gives them over time increasing advantages because they understand that data in ways that other people don't even know uh, exist. Right? So their access to machine learning, artificial intelligence, gives them a kind of increasing returns to data, makes it very, very difficult for people to enter. So I, I think th those are just some examples of the wide variety of barriers to entry that are, are supporting some of the, uh, the rent data that we see and prevent real, uh, present real challenges for uh, competition policy. So, so let me just su uh, suggest in conclusion that um, while it is the case that there's no one-size-fits-all solution, one size fits all solution to this, um, it is pretty clear from the ex examples of, say, killer acquisitions or Facebook applications that the anti antitrust authorities are, are easily able to, to miss significant acquisitions that foreclose potential competition. Uh, and therefore, uh, for firms that, are, that can be identified as already having significant barriers to entry that are generating significant rents, and we could use a, a measure like their Q value to do this, it, I think it would make sense uh, for the authorities, which they could do under existing law, uh, to change their, their status or to change their stance towards acquisitions and mergers by these companies and to say, we're going to presume that any acquisition by you is probably going to uh, increase the barrier to entry which you already enjoy or support it over time. And therefore, we're going to allow that merger only on clear and convincing evidence provided uh, that it's not going to cause some sort of harm. Uh, secondly, that under those conditions, any merger that's uh, approved should be subject to uh, significant review for a reasonable period of time. And when there is evidence that there has been either a, a support for barrier to entry or some other kind of harm, uh, that, the, that the approving agency should go for rescission uh, as soon as they make that determination. So, and I, I believe that under S Section 7 of the Clayton Act, that, that the power to do all those things already exists. Um, so, in conclusion, uh, I think there's really sound evidence that there, there are significant barriers to entry that are allowing large numbers of corporations to earn rent. Uh, the sources are varied, uh, but at least one step forward would be to change the way that we enforce uh, merger policy. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. I think these were some uh, really good talks. And now I invite our discussants, uh, Jim and Greg, to comment or critique these presentations. When I was growing up, there was a very popular cartoon 
uh, in the newspapers. Uh, Walt, Walt Kelly's Pogo that famously said, uh, we have seen the enemy and he is us. This is in the middle of the Vietnam War. So I'm going to paraphrase this. We have met, uh, no, we have met the enemy, sorry, and he is us. We have met the enemy and he is me. I had the disadvantage of being both from BYU and a neoclassical economist at the University of Utah. Uh, <laughs> second thing I want to note is uh, I've not had the privilege of meeting Marshall before, but I many years ago attended a seminar uh, in which uh, Franco Bogliani was speaking, who spoke famously fast. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, Bob Solo was a, a panelist with him. And Solo said that he didn't want equal time, he wanted equal words. <laughs> now, I have two trivial points to begin with about, about labeling. I understand why labeling occurs. It's a shorthand for lots of things. I just think we ought to be careful about the labeling here, and then I'll move to some more substantive things. As a first point, what Bork calls the consumer welfare standard isn't what an economist wouldn't think of as a consumer welfare standard. Bork wasn't a particularly good economist. Uh, he didn't distinguish between consumer surplus and producer surplus, and his standard is what economists would term total, total surplus or net social welfare. That he happened to have labeled it consumer welfare doesn't make it so. This is demonstrably not the standard in the courts, which, if we were to map map into economic jargon, uh, would be consumer surplus. Uh, so it's misleading to think of Bork's labeling of what is clearly not consumer welfare standard to be the consumer welfare standard that at least the courts use. And I think most economists uh, of the neoclassical per, uh, persuasion use. In this regard, there's been a long back and forth between economists and policymakers about whether efficiencies is captured in the second of Mark, uh, Mark's uh, diagrams, um, the Williamson diagram. For example, whether an increase in producer sur surplus should be able to offset uh, a loss in consumer surplus and I think that's been re rejected for the most part by the courts and by the enforcement agencies. And efficiencies only matter uh, if they're sufficiently large, if there's no net loss in consumer welfare or consumer surplus. In this regard, Carl Shapiro and Joe Farrell in a 1999, 1990 article, and again in a 2000 article, it reprises it, elucidate what they call the no synergies theorem which says roughly that the only kinds of efficiencies that might make a merger acceptable are those tied to synergies, not scale economies. Put differently, they show that in a Cournot model, the scale efficiencies have to be improbably large to lead to a reduction in output and an increase in price. Not to lead, I'm sorry, to a reduction in output and in, in increase in price. I'll return to mergers later. In the end, in the, end the standard, uh, again, in economic terms, it's pretty straightforward. An action is bad if it increases or would likely increase prices that consumers pay, which submit, since demand curves slope downward, is sometimes put forward in the positive as an action is good if it reduces prices and increases the quantity or quality of the goods that consumers get. My second somewhat trivial point is that labeling this to Chicago school is highly misleading. I understand why I came out of Chicago and I understand why that label got attached to it. But the big players in antitrust enforcement, uh, DOJ staff and assistant attorneys general for antitrust are predominantly MIT, Berkeley, Stanford, Princeton, and Harvard trained. Carl Shapiro, MIT, Michael Winston, MIT, Steve Solop, MIT, Jean Terrell, MIT, Fiona Scott Morton, MIT, Dan Rutenfeld, MIT, and Joe Farrell, Oxford. A set of names I pulled up off the top of my head as I'm thinking about sort of who plays a big role here. Among the leaders, of the so-called Chicago School is Dennis Carlton, also from MIT, uh, hardly the Chicago School. So I don't think the Chicago School label is particularly useful anymore, although it may have once been as, as a way of thinking about the origin. To more substantive matters. Um, and, and let me sort of deviate slightly and comment on, on uh, in defense of neoclassical economics, and, and in response to Marshall's comment, the empirical work that's been done, the important, work, the important empirical work that's been done in the last few years, has mostly been done by neoclassical economists. So the joint ownership problem referred to in the first session that many of you know about, uh, and the potential cartelization uh, by 
Vanguard owning all of the airline stocks. That was two neoclassical economists. In fact, they happen to be members of the firm that I'm affiliated with, uh, Charles River, associates of the first publishers of that paper. The merger and retroactive studies done by John Colgan, certainly a neoclassical economist, and among the best of the studies demonstrating that mergers have, for the most part, not succeeded to, in achieving the efficiencies that were claimed. Uh, Shapiro, who got rejected in the AT&T Time Warner case. Shapiro was the government's expert, Dennis Carlton, uh, both from MIT. One on what I would think I was not the Chicago school, and the other one I suppose the Chicago school. Shapiro's work was fabulous uh, in terms of the cost of that merger. Uh, he got rejected by the judge in a very nasty decision, uh, which was sustained in an appellate court, but that doesn't mean it wasn't great economics in the first place. And all of, almost all of the work on monopsony begins with Orly Ashenfelder, uh, surely uh, a neoclassical economist. Uh, so I, I reject Marshall's characterization of the fact that economists don't look for, or contemporary antitrust practitioners don't look for empirical evidence. They do. And in fact, I would argue that the important empirical evidence has come from precisely the group of economists that he thinks uh, are, are, are subject to such criticism. So, back to Mark. Uh, Mark and I are close friends. We've been knowing each other for many years. Uh, I agree with most of what Mark said, but I mostly disagree with what he says in his article. So, let me go through with this. In his article, he has a long section on, the diff uh, on you can't go from ordinal to cardinal. Uh, that's just not true. Maximizing consumers do it all the time. Uh, the ratio of marginal utilities, what we might call the marginal rate of substitution of A for B, is equal to the price ratios. So relative price ratios are a, a, a cardinal outcome of an ordinary that con consumers had. The Vickery Clark Rose mechanism and generalized second highest bidder pays auctions require truthful revelation of willingness to pay. And the billions that big tech companies have made are a testament to the fact that ordinal gets mapped into cardinal in a very big way, uh, leading to billions and billions of dollars. Periodic pricing regressions, uh, a standard in most analysis, uh, uh, map in the same way. Discrete choice models, particularly mixed logit, nested logit, generalized extreme value function models. McFadden and later train show that, quote, any true choice model can be approximated to any accuracy, degree of accuracy by a mixed logit. Conjoint analysis and surveys, uh, max diff surveys uh, and analysis with a market price option as numeraire. In the second AMS, uh, Apple Samsung trial, my use of max diff, uh, which was the first time it had been used in federal courts, survived a rigorous Daubert challenge before a judge, Lucy Coe, not exactly uh, 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 a violet uh, in, in the patch. All right, next, there are two theoretically correct welfare measures of consuming gain and loss that do not have the problems that Mark suggests, compensating variation and equivalent variation. The problem, of course, with ordinary demand curves is that willingness to pay is affected by income. Here, Mark and I agree. And in a market, demanders have very different incomes. Uh, even so, Bob Willig's, Robbie Willig's consumer surplus without apology shows that consumer surplus is, in most cases, close enough. He also provides estimable bounds on <coughs> errors in using consumer surplus to estimate the theoretically correct surplus measures that are generally smaller than the errors in estimating the demand curve itself. Willig concludes, at the level of the individual consumer, cost-benefit welfare analysis can be formed rigorously and unapologetically by means of consumer surplus. Willig's bounds, I still parenthetically, depend upon the income elasticity of demand in the region, the price change, and the fraction of a person's income spent on the good. So you can decide whether you should use it or not, because he gives you this test for whether or not it's a reliable measure. Marty Weitzman, Consumer surplus is an exact approximation when prices are uh, appropriately deflated in the QJ 1998, 1988. Weitzman concludes, quote, the lowly consumer surplus triangle and rectangle methodology can be rigorously defended as an exact approximation to the theoretically meaningful measure. By that, he meant compensating or equivalent variation. As long as prices are appropriately deflated, Weitzman then shows how to find the deflator as a practical matter. Jerry Hausman, exact consumer surplus and deadweight loss, AER 1981. 
shows that for a single price change, no approximation is necessary. He concludes, from an estimation of the demand curve, the Marshallian demand curve, we can derive a measure of the exact consumer surplus, whether it is in the compensating variation, equivalent variation, or some other measure of utility change. No approximation is involved. Hausman's approach can deal, in some cases, with conditions where Willink's results don't hold. Similar work has been done by Dewart, by Dixit, by Varian, and many others. Mark in his paper has some stuff on happiness studies. He didn't report, he didn't discuss it here. Uh, let me just comment on that uh, in case you read his paper. Uh, I confess I'm not sure what to make of happiness studies. They've always perplexed me. I don't think that they can be used to inform policy. Surely there's something deep in the human psyche, perhaps it's genetic, I don't know. That means for the most part, humans can find equal happiness in lots of circumstances. And that if it's relative deprivation that matters, then this depends solely on relative position, whatever the absolute value, the absolute fat position is. By the way, if, if Mark is unwilling to allow cardinalization of orderings and interpersonal comparisons, then he can't place much stock in happiness studies, which assume, for example, that a seven on a scale of one to 10 means the same to everyone, or frankly, that it means anything at all. Next, the Pareto criteria is too rigid. And in a way that I'm sure most people in this conference would find highly objectionable, in that it essentially enshrines the status quo, whatever the status quo happens to be. It's well known, for example, that free trade creates winners and losers. It's equally well known that tariffs create winners and losers. So suppose that the initial state of the world was free trade, with the Pareto criteria, uh, criteria, one could never move away from free trade. Or conversely, if the initial state of the world was smooth only tariffs, with the Pareto criteria, one could never move away from tariffs. That's just too strong of a condition for doing policy analysis. Uh, and I think you can, we can mark appeal to your intuition and, and, and common sense, so I'm going to. Uh, suppose I had a policy change that would increase the income by $1 for mil one million households but reduced by $1 the household income of one household. Pareto would say no. Any sensible balancing would say yes to that policy. Next, antitrust law shouldn't be expected to solve all problems. It's not a Swiss Army knife, as others have noted. Uh, consider the, 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 the problem of increasing concentration. It is a puzzle. I think the, the, the evidence is there, and I, I agree. Uh, but there are two possibilities. One is more concentrated is that evidence that markets are less competitive. Alternatively, more concentrated is evidence that firms are more efficient because of scale, scope, or network effects. We need to do the empirical work to tease out those two options. I don't think it's been well done, and I don't think it can be do, done globally, so I'm not particularly keen about the macro view of this matter. Uh, because I do believe that this is market by market, uh, then it's unlikely to be the same answer in every market one looks at. But if we agree that it exists, that is market con concentration exists and is bad, the question still remains, is it best solved by regulation or by traditional uh, or by competition? Put some, somewhat differently, what is the specific regulation that presenters have in mind, for example, to deal with Facebook or Google? It's unclear to me, uh, and I've read a fair amount in the area and listened to the concert here, or the, the, the comments here. My concerns are that if you limit firm growth as a method of, for competing with rivals, you make more important competition through political influence, using the political process to erect barriers to entry or raising rivals' costs, and then the associated rent seeking, which has an uncertain outcome, that in the end may lead to increased concentration by politically favored firms. Next, if you make antitrust more political, it's not clear that you get more democratic outcomes. The neo Brandeisian approach, approach makes rent creation and rent seeking more profitable, at least for me. That is, it makes the assertion of political power more important. Brandeis had a particularly skeptical view of consumers, by the way. He called them, quote, servile, self-indulgent, uh, indolent, and ignorant. Uh, the aim of limiting economic power was directed at stemming the threat it posed to what political power could do to so mold and shape the country in the image of the political elite, something that Thomas Sowell called the vision of the anointed. Political power of large firms is no, it's a big problem. I agree with that. But the question is, can antitrust solve that problem? Or is more 
particularly put, is it the best device for solving uh, that problem of, of undue political power? I would prefer to deal with these kinds of problems directly and head on rather than obliquely. It strikes me that antitrust is a particularly blunt instrument uh, uh, for trying to do that. Uh, campaign finance reform, broader transparency, broader legal definitions of tr uh, corruption, disclosure of who pays for political ads, the right to become, uh, uh, to, to become invisible uh, as the Europeans have now pursued. Next, income distributional problems are best solved elsewhere as well with a progressive income tax system that's coupled with an earned income tax credit, that is a negative uh, income tax. Data privacy and ownership problems are best solved elsewhere, with rules that, for example, require big tech to purge histories and to be transparent in their disclosure about what kind of evidence they're collecting and selling and who they're selling it to. And in my view, finally, uh, employment opportunities are best handled elsewhere as well. We need, I believe, a low implementation cost standard uh, criteria, one that ensures consumers benefit and doesn't punish a firm merely because it becomes large and successful or so-called powerful. Now, my view, the consumer welfare standard does that. It has a very simple test. Are prices likely to be lower and is quantity likely to be higher or is quality likely to improve? Uh, my time is up. Um, <laughs> So let me give two final uh, notions here. Uh, in my view, and I think I, sh I share this with most of the quote neoclassical group, merger policy is far too uh, lenient. Um, and we, you know, uh, with regard to scale economies, scope economies, and synergy, uh, and, and uh, 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 network effects, let the market prove it. Uh, just say no. Uh, and, and because if they're there, uh, firms will grow organically in response to this, the economies that are present in whatever technologies are available. By the way, I don't, uh, I, I'm less uh, sanguine, or not, not less sanguine, I'm more skeptical about, about the, the whole notion of network externalities. We, it is true that if you just look at network externalities, firms are going to be larger. But that doesn't mean that in our minds competition because cons consumers can often participate in multiple networks at the same time, uh, which tends to be overlooked in the people who make these arguments. So for example, credit card networks are large, but I have in my pocket three different kinds of credit cards. I have a Discover, a Visa, a and a MasterCard, and I can switch between networks just like that. Similarly, uh, Facebook is a large network. Uh, but you could have, uh, there's no reason why people who are half my age who like these things, a third of my age who like these things, okay? Uh, wow. There's no reason why they can't be in multiple networks uh, at the same time. You can switch between them. So, so network externality should be thought as a, as a way of determining a single large firm in the net. Um, I think the courts ought to take more seriously a problem in modern tech, not a problem, but a an aspect of modern technologies, which is things that are complements can quickly become substitutes. Uh, and and uh, for example, uh, I think everybody in this room, I suppose, agrees, and I do, that, that, that allowing Facebook to buy Instagram was a mistake. I assume that the argument was sort of it's a complement, it's not a substitute, but it's clearly a substitute today. Uh, it didn't take very long for it to become a substitute, and that's true about lots of modern high tech, all right? is that, that what is a complement can quickly morph into a substitute, and therefore we have to be very skeptical about mergers that bring complements into the, into the. Final thing I'll say is, is uh, it's because I was involved in a case that just settled, uh, the uh, Trinco uh, needs to be overturned. Uh, and the Tenth Circuit, which is actually uh, Justice Gorsuch's decision, and Novell versus Microsoft, which is sort of Trinco on steroids, uh, needs to be overturned as well. The profit sacrifice test, which is, it, it is nonsense. It is not a legitimate economic test. Uh, and in the case that I was just in, in uh, uh, before Judge Waddups, uh, the defense, this is the attorneys, not an economist, but the attorneys on the defendant's side said, there's been no profit sacrifice. And the argument they made was essentially, this firm was so good at quickly moving to a monopoly position that it got the monopoly profits in day two. Uh, 
and as a consequence, no profit sacrifice, and therefore perfectly legal under Judge Borsch's standard. This is wrong, all right? It's, it's pretty clear that, the, at least in my view, that the defendant in the case uh, had, had, util, had taken unilateral actions that foreign competition uh, uh, in a, a substantial degree. Jim, you need to tell us what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. I, I, and like, like others, I want to thank uh, the University of Utah and, um, for organizing this conference. But I also want to thank the out-of-town participants for coming in. As someone mentioned this morning, you know, it's nice to get out of Washington and in the fresh, clean mountain air where you can say what you think. But it's also great for us who live out here in the fresh, clean mountain air to have people you know, from uh, other, other areas come in and us not have to get on an airplane to, to you know, experience this. So uh, thanks a lot for making the trip. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm not an academic. Um, so I'll give you a little, uh, yeah, and you'll see that in some of my comments here, a little bit of a different take. Uh, I work in private practice. I'm a consulting economist. Um, so I do a lot of antitrust uh, in the trenches, um, so to speak. I, I'm working with clients who are involved in antitrust litigation or regulatory enforcement actions, often hard scott merger review. Um, and uh, I, I work in a small firm here in Salt Lake. I'm very fortunate uh, to work with two excellent academics, Mark and Jim. And I am going to play the role today that I play in the office pretty much every day, which is peacemaker between the two of them. Um, uh, but but uh, in all seriousness, um, I, uh, Mark's comment about uh, the goals of antitrust, um, I'm not quite sure what Mark's position is, and I, I've um, avoided questioning him on this in the office so I could do it here. But um, as to whether he believes that um, the, the goals of antitrust should not include lower prices, um, or con you know, consumer prices should not be a goal of antitrust at all, or consumer prices shouldn't be the only goal of antitrust. Um, you know, I, I believe consumer prices are something that should be a goal of antitrust, but I think I've come around to the view that they probably shouldn't be the only goal. Um, I think this morning, uh, Dean Barker mentioned the phrase, uh, you know, asked the question uh, of the panelists, do you think we're doing the wrong thing versus not doing the right thing correctly? Um, I think that's a great way to put it, um, but not necessarily, I mean, maybe it's a bit of a false dichotomy because you, um, I think we all agree we're not doing the right thing correctly to the degree we think um, looking at consumer prices is the right thing. Um, but we could be doing, we could be not doing the right thing correctly while at the same time not doing all the right things. In other words, we're, you know, we're not doing a good job of antitrust enforcement in looking at consumer prices, um, but maybe we should look at some other things as well. Um, as Jim mentioned, he says uh, antitrust is not a Swiss army knife. Um, and that, I think that used to be my view. Um, people would mention things like inequality, um, et cetera. And I'd say, well, that's great, that's important, uh, but that's not antitrust. And I, I think I've come around to the view, well, why not? Um, I, you know, I, I think of it when I teach industrial organization, I tell my students, well, what is it? Or when people ask me in the elevator, what's antitrust? I say, well, it's structure, conduct, performance. And not to go back to a discredited methodology and you know, to, to just looking at concentration as a measure of market power. But what we generally care about in industrial organization and antitrust is the structure of markets and the conduct within those markets affects performance of those markets. And typically we think of performance as consumer prices. That's what we've come to. Um, but I think it's clear that people care about things other than just consumer prices. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about the happiness literature, but I, but I think just in general we'd all agree there's things important in life other than low consumer prices. And to the degree we think that the structure and conduct in markets affects some of those other things, then why isn't it antitrust? Um, so at least in principle, um, I think I agree that you know, we should be looking at things other than consumer prices, although I don't think I would go uh, so far as to say we, we shouldn't look at consumer prices at all. I think the empirical evidence is yeah, people like low prices. Everything else equal, um, that's good. Um, oops. Now in practice, and as I said, I'm a practicing economist, consumer prices are an easy thing to look at. Um, Professor Wu said this morning, the things you really care about most are hard to measure. And that's right. Um, and prices, but prices are pretty easy to measure. It's a joke I tell my students sometime when um, I'm teaching. You know, a person comes out of a bar late at night. 
notices someone stumbling around under a light post, obviously inebriated, um, looking on the ground. He says, can I help you? The guy says, yeah, I dropped my keys and I can't find them. So this good Samaritan helps him look around for a while, and he can't see the keys either, and where could they be? He says, well, let's, let's figure this out. Tell me exactly where you were standing when you dropped them. And the, guy, the drunk says, I was standing down in that dark alley over there. And he said, well, why are you looking here? He said, because the light's better. And that's, <laughs> that's sort of what we do. In, you know, maybe that's sort of what we do in antitrust. We look at price effects. Um, why? Is that what we really care about? Well, maybe, but maybe it's just also the light's better there. That's something we can measure. Um, so when, you know, I, I, can, I can take price data, I can do econometric analysis, I can tell that prices go up before or after the merger. Um, with exclusionary conduct, you know, if we're, if we're lucky, the case drags on long enough, the conduct has had its effect, the, um, the competitor has been excluded from the market, and so I can look and say, well, did prices go or prices lower when the competitor was in the market or not? So that's something I can measure. Um, I'm not quite sure how I would go about measuring some of the other effects. Um, so if, if you know, someone asks me, here's a merger, um, what's its effect going to be on inequality? I don't have tools for that. And you know, maybe that's a research agenda. Maybe we need tools for that. Um, but I don't know what they are right now. Um, I also don't know how to do the balancing. Tell me, if, um, what if a merger is going to lead to lower prices? but um, also increase, say, inequality or have concentrated adverse employment effects. Um, how do you balance those two? And, you know, as a challenge to Mark, um, if we think that um, it's hard to do interpersonal comparisons of utility and a dollar gain to one person versus a dollar loss to another person, how do I compare those? Uh, how do I compare lower prices to somebody with somebody else losing their job or concentrated unemployment effects in a local area? I mean, that's, that's a hard thing to measure. And again, maybe we need better tools for that. I do sort of have one suggestion, and this is not well thought out, so don't hold me to it. And Marshall um, he mentioned something related to this, which is, um, you know, you do merger work. Um, every merger I get involved in um, has um, substantial horizontal overlap. That doesn't mean every mar merger has substantial horizontal overlap, but the ones where our economists do. Um, and so we're typically looking at a presumption of an increase in market power, and the way the mergers get justified is, well, the efficiencies outweigh it. Um, well, a lot of times when you drill down on the efficiencies, it's somebody losing their job. I mean, you, you know, and as Marshall said, you know, in the rarefied world of antitrust, we all look at that and go, oh, yeah, yeah, efficiencies, you know, you're going to save some money. Um, which I think a lot of non-antitrust people would look at that and go, that's crazy. You're saying that's a good thing, that people are going to lose their jobs. But, but that's how we treat it. Um, that's how we treat it. Um, now, in the merger, current merger guidelines, and I'm pretty sure this is current, I looked it up last night. Um, <clears throat> Cognizable, you know, all efficiencies don't count, only cognizable efficiencies count. And efficiencies are cognizable if they're merger specific, verified, as Jim mentioned, you know, maybe we need to do a better job of verifying them, but also if they do not arise from anti-competitive reductions in output or service. So we already have a restriction on what we'll consider cognizable. Maybe we should think about cognizable efficiencies as also not arising from reductions in employment. I mean, maybe that's, you know, something we could, first step that we could think about. Um, and um, I think in terms of, you know, what should we do? Um, I like to pick low-hanging fruit. Uh, first thing we should do, I think this is broad agreement, we should make existing, you know, enforcement more robust. Um, it, it's, I think it's pretty well agreed that um, contemporary merger enforcement hasn't been strict enough. Um, and um, I think the same is, is true. It's harder to prove in, in terms of monopolization and exclusionary conduct. Um, you know, and I think as economists, we're, at, uh, we're to blame somewhat. We developed a bunch of models that said predatory pricing you know, can't, be, um, can't be profitable. It would never happen. Uh, aftermarket monopolization, firms would never mo monopolize their aftermarket. It would hurt them too much in their reputation in the foremarket. They would never do that. Uh, we have models for that, and I, I've taught those models. You know, it's, Again, like another famous economist joke, you know, two economists are walking down the street, and one of them looks down and sees a $20 bill and says, hey, look, a $20 bill. And the other economist says, no, it can't be. Somebody would have picked it up already. Um, well, you know, that's kind of how we treat exclusionary conduct. We say, well, predatory pricing, no, that would never happen. Or, you know, aftermarket monopolization, that would never happen. But we see it happen all the time. Um, and we need better models, and actually, Jim, I think he's pointing out, we have better models. It's just they haven't really gotten the traction. Um, so what do we do? Um, 
one of the things is we do this. Um, hopefully a lot of you out there are students. Um, and you know, we need to do things like, I need to do a better job when I'm teaching uh, of, of not just teaching um, the traditional I.O. textbook that might tell you that predatory pricing could never happen, et cetera. Um, so I think that's, that's an area where we could do better. And I've gotten a sign from Pavitra and I. You know, Greg, I, I was actually walking down the street in Chicago a couple of months ago and I saw a $20 bill on the sidewalk. Uh -huh. And I sat there and I stared at it. I because you, because you I said, there's, the there's something wrong out. here. <laughs> <laughs> Another guy came by and picked it up and walked away. <laughs> but, and that's a true story. So He was an accountant. <laughs> so, but I really was kind of shocked. And so, all right. So, it, I have a few things to answer. So, first, prices matter. The competitive process matters. Um, I agree a lot of with Jim and I have been friends a long time, and when we do antitrust cases, we almost always see eye to eye on some of these basic, you know, policy matters that. We, we don't, so I, I need to reply to a few things that he said. Um, Pareto optimality, you're right. It's, it's not a useful standard in, in antitrust. Uh, in free trade, it, it might be, but we don't do the compensation. So, I mean, if we did the compensation, maybe there were, then it might be Pareto optimal. But um, I think my message that I was trying to say, or the message I was, trying to convey is that we really, economists really should not be setting the goals because we don't really have the economic tools to set the goals. That should be the job of the lawyers and the policy makers. We can do the empirical evidence. You know, we can talk about the costs or, or how effective we might be with antitrust. But I'm not sure that we're in the position to set the goals. Um, you mentioned and I think you're right that in the merger guidelines, for example, the way that um, I, I presented the original model, the merger guidelines were revised in, uh, um, a couple of times, but in 1992, when they revised the merger guidelines, the efficiencies have to affect the price, okay? And then they've added that, the, um, that there's other goals, innovation, product quality, Okay, and to, effect, to the extent that it affects price, then they matter. The effect that it doesn't, they, they may not matter. And my takeaway from that is that they're not using the consumer, the original consumer uh, welfare model anymore. It's become, it, it, it's so unuseful that it's become so broad that it encompasses anything. To give you an example, today, uh, Carl Shapiro, in his testimony before Congress, said that the that what we mean by the, the consumer welfare model is the competitive process. I went back and got his speech, and I compared it with Tim Wu's book. They're exactly the same. Tim Wu and Carl Shapiro agree on the goal. Carl Shapiro just wants to hold on to the consumer welfare model for some reason. I think it's, some, it's, it's because it's some, uh, to have access to orthodoxy in antitrust, you have to hold on to it, even, even if it's not useful. I've talked to some of the major economists, including, and I've asked them, and I've, and I've asked them, you know, point blank, you know, we can't do interpersonal comparisons of utility, which we can't, Jim. Um, you can pick up any welfare economics textbook, and I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that we can't do that. And sometimes the answer, the, the, in private, the real answer is that, you know, if we as economists uh, give up the consumer welfare standard, we don't have a lot to say about, about policy. We have a lot to say about empirics and lots of things, but not about the goals. And I think that's probably, we should just be honest about that at some point. Um, you, you mentioned uh, a, a whole number of studies that made it sound like, oh, we don't really have this, this problem, that we, we can take ordinal utility, ordinal utility and add them and come to something meaningful. The, the problem is that you didn't mention all of the restrictions. For example, you talked about compensating variation and equivalent variation and then Bobby Willick's article. I mentioned that too. Um, but that 
that's for an individual demand curve. You can't add compensating variation. You can't add equivalent variation. Those are ordinal, in a sense, they're ordinal measures that, that aren't added. And I think that's a, a known result in welfare economics. You talked about a number of demand studies, but those studies have restrictions. For instance, there's something close to the, Gore, the, the Gorman form that has to be assumed when you're doing, for instance, the AIDS model. And you're, and you're doing, so, so I think that if you dig through this literature, you're gonna find other restrictions. I mean, the Gorman form says that, um, it says that as income increases, you buy the same goods, no matter what. I mean, that's not a sensible, um, that's again, it's, it's, it's a minimal restriction that makes things work, but it's not really sensible. So, you know, I don't know all of the studies that you mentioned, you know, and you know me, I'm gonna read them all now. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna check. <laughs> And so, you know, maybe you're right, but, but the ones that I'm aware of always have these restrictions. Um, then the last thing I want to say is, is what I call the belt and suspenders argument, which is that I always hear from conservative economists, oh, there's always a better way to do something. You want to, you don't want, we, let's not use antitrust for uh, dispersion of economic power because we can handle that by just having um, overturning Citizens United and limiting political contributions. And then, and then we never do that. You, you know what I mean? So, so why not do, you can, sometimes you can do things several ways on several fronts. Antitrust may be just part of the solution to many of these different problems that the new Brandeis School is talking about. So, okay. Yeah, I'll speak to a couple of the things that Jim said. Um, you know, first of all, this idea that uh, you know all of the research that's been done into imperfections in, uh, in markets and the prevalence of market power um, is due to neoclassical economics. I mean, I think that in itself that you're you're pushing back on mislabeling, uh, but you know, I think that is also a mislabeling. Um, nothing, you know, the I'm a neoclassical economist. Monopsony is a neoclassical concept, or at least it can be. The idea that workers are paid less than their marginal product of labor is entirely consistent with at least the overall uh, uh, structure of neoclassical classical economics. The question is uh, whether those uh, empirical realities are reflected in uh, antitrust policy, uh, and uh, the answer is not. I mean, the uh, law of vertical restraints that's so permissive essentially takes the, the coercion of, uh, of uh, disempowered suppliers as being good for economic outcomes, specifically for consumer welfare, um, and, you know, as, as Mark has said, in the merger context, and just more generally, if um, the markets in which those suppliers are hired is uh, monopsonized, then um, it's just not true that that is a, uh, enhances uh, efficiency. It's a reduction in efficiency in entirely neoclassical terms. Um, so yes, I mean, neoclassical economics has provided lots of the evidence that uh, neoclassical theoretical assumptions are false. Um, I think that is rather a, a, it should be interpreted as a challenge to the existing uh, antitrust regime and not a strength of it. Um, uh, you also sort of brought up the, the point that you know, we don't know from concentration per se whether uh, competition has been harmed or benefited, um, but uh, that, that's true that concentration per se doesn't tell you that, but other facts do. So that's why I was mentioning um, the evidence of a reduction in firm level investment is not consistent with the idea that uh, uh, high rising fixed cost of entry, for example, may make markets more concentrated and therefore less competitive in a, uh, in a static sense, but more competitive dynamically. Um, you know, we just don't have the evidence that those uh, rising fixed costs are there because that would be evidence to, or that would be shown by uh, corporate uh, investment. And similarly, the idea that, you know, monopolizing a market could be a sign that a firm is very efficient. Um, okay, then, but consumers should benefit thereby if, if the most efficient firm is gaining market share because they're charging lower prices and getting business away from their competitors um, and that's benefiting consumers we shouldn't be seeing rising markups so um, you know these sort of like standard theoretical arguments for why uh, uh, deriving um, uh, policy conclusions from concentration um, you know you know you have to take those a few steps farther namely to investigate whether their um, empirical uh, implications are actually satisfied or not um, and finally you mentioned the um, idea that, you know, con that uh, uh, options per se don't, um, uh, or, or uh, that 
uh, you know, you can you can uh, use whatever credit card you want. Um, and so the fact that credit card networks are are large and therefore that credit card companies might enjoy network effects doesn't seem to mean that individuals can't make use of more than one network at a time. I mean, again, I would say take that reasoning a step further. Um, the fact that you can have more than one credit card in your wallet hasn't uh, reduced the fact it, it re reduced the reality that this is a highly uncompetitive sector where enormous rents are, are earned by incumbent providers and where you know they have taken steps, uh, as the uh, Amex case shows, to uh, restrict the degree of competition that can actually take place. Um, even if there's you know multiple brands in the marketplace, they're not really competing against one another for uh, for business. All right, so we can open up uh, for audience comments and critique. Okay, Gabriel. Can go to Gabriel. I'm Gabriel Lozada from the University of Utah. So, um, Professor Curl, I think perhaps somewhat ironically mentioned the uh, paper by uh, Hausman, because just before he was talking about well, Willig's paper, uh, one of the things that Hausman most importantly showed was that the Marshallian demand curve, which is what, uh, which is what, Willig, what Willig says you can use without apology, uh, doesn't give a good estimate of deadweight loss. Um, in fact, the deadweight loss figure that you get from the Marshalling demand curve isn't bounded uh, between uh, the one you get from the EV and CV curves. And deadweight loss is often the thing that we're concerned about as economists when it comes to something like a merger. Um, so the other thing he said about Hausen's paper is he showed that um, you can empirically estimate exact um, compensating variation and exact equivalent variation. Okay, so where does that give you? Where does that get you? That gets you to two inconsistent measures of consumer welfare, EV and CV. Which one is right, which one is wrong? They're both right. But they're also in some sense both wrong. They can be inconsistent. You can get cycles. That was, that was shown by Skatowski in, I think, 1942. So it doesn't particularly get you very far, and that's for the individual. Now, how about uh, Mark was saying we're talking about markets and antitrust. So how about aggregates? Well, aggregating compensating variation or equivalent variation is quite problematic. Um, if you do it in an unweighted way, which is the way that it's usually done, then you're saying that, as Mark said, a dollar is a dollar. And um, that means that the people who have more dollars count more in your social calculus and the people that have less dollars. That's a, that, that, ha, that has a clear ideological effect. Uh, perhaps the economist who, who uses that metric doesn't realize it, but it certainly does. Uh, in, in particular, it disadvantages poor people and advantages uh, the more wealthy. Um, yeah, so. I think those are the main points I wanted to say. Uh, I, uh, I agree that Hasman shows that deadweight loss is not well estimated. Uh, I was just focusing on the price quantity uh, as a standard. Um, I, I, the one statement you made there that if a dollar is a dollar, rich people work more than poor people, that's that's just not true. I mean, the, the dollar that we're talking about here is the dollar on the incremental purchase, uh, on the marginal purchase. And, and, what, and so Mark painted with a pretty broad brush, and I do the same thing when I teach this. I say, you know, you've got to assume a dollar is a dollar. But what we really mean is a dollar spent in a market to buy an additional good. And the, the question is, 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 is the dollar, does Bill Gates get more from buying an orange for a dollar? than Jim Crow gets from buying an orange for a dollar. It seems unlikely. Well, we're measuring willingness to pay. And Bill Gates' willingness to pay a lot of people mine. Uh, that's right. But in the market, I see Bill Gates buying oranges, and he buys three oranges at a buck a piece. I know what the marginal orange is worth to Bill Gates. And if I buy 10 oranges, uh, uh, I know what the 10th orange is worth to me. And it's worth the same amount as it was to Bill Gates, because we both paid a dollar for the marginal orange. 
So that's that's the dollars we're talking about. Well, the do the, the dollar market, not just the market. Yeah, it's it's super large the market. Market. <laughs> so anyway, trying may, Can I add one one additional thing that I in my mad dash to conclude? Uh, <laughs> I think Mark, sorry, Mark, misinterprets Pareto. So let me uh, try try to resurrect Pareto. Um, I think Pareto is not good for policy analysis for the reason I suggested. I mean, it, it allows the status quo to sit, and we ought to be able to move away from the status quo and not have an economist argue, wait a minute, that's right. But, but, but the issue is not whether a specific lawsuit uh, has Pareto characteristics. It doesn't. It's about sunk costs. Uh, uh, it's, about, it's about the past for the most part. There's some future. The issue is, and, and therefore, in some sense, it is of no interest to an economist. So, so litigation over a contract dispute is not of interest to an economist or to tort dispute or an antitrust dispute. These are all sunk costs, right? The reason it's of interest is because it creates a set of incentives about future behavior. So the question is whether or not legal rules uh, established precedentially by looking back give forward-looking incentives that have parental criteria. Uh, and they may or may not. I mean, that's, that's an interesting question. Uh, but that's certainly, if you look at the general law and economics literature, that's certainly the claim. It may be wrong right or wrong, which is we litigate this, we develop a set of rules, all right, uh, 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 expectation damages in contracts. And we don't care about the dispute that's in front of us. What we care about is how do people respond if that's the rule going forward? <laughs> and the way they structure their business and their contracts. And is that way it's structured, does it, that have a Pareto uh, characteristic? And, and that strikes me as the, you know, the important issue here is, is what kind of incentives do we create for businesses and households and individuals going forward? This is a really hard problem. I'm not claiming we get the right outcome here. I'm just saying the issue is not the lawsuit. The issue is the incentives. Okay, let's get another question there. Dean Baker, Center for Economic and Policy Research in the University of Utah. Um, I'm going to bring Mark Jasilik back into the discussion here. Um, I came here earlier, I was talking about uh, monopoly capital, so I guess I'm still stuck in the 60s. And I, I saw your charts, and I couldn't help noticing you're using Q as a measure of rents, and you begin in the 70s. And I, I just have to go. Of course, the stock market plunged at the beginning of the 70s. As we know, you had much higher price to earnings ratios in the 60s. So if we're telling a story of growing monopolization leading to higher Qs, you know, 80s, 90s, and the last decade, uh, it would seem we'd also have to tell that story about the 60s. Yeah, I, uh, let me just say that the, the time period wasn't, uh, wasn't chosen, or arbitrarily was chosen for us by uh, Taylors and Peter who produced the, uh, the firm level data. We use their data because they do a really uh, careful job of, of adjusting for um, intangible capital. Uh, and the difficulty they had, I think, in going earlier is that uh, the, the source of consistent data, CompuStat, which uh, you know, it has all the firm level uh, variables that they use, really is very sparse uh, before 1975. So we're just kind of stuck with this okay, well, set of data. No, 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 but, but uh, I mean, I, I think the point is, is not, uh, I mean, I, I think there, there are two points, really. One, there, you know, there is a, there still is a trend, I mean, uh, over the, the time period that we observed. So that, I mean, that's there in the data. Um, and, uh, you know, regardless of the source of the, the increase in the price earnings ratio or the increase in the stock market value, the arbitrage argument is still there. That is, regardless of the reason that market values are high, uh, arbitrage would say that if entry were free, that, uh, that ratio would come down, right? Because, our, I mean, normally in economics, especially in finance, the assumption is arbitrage is is powerful, and almost all of financial economics is based on no arbitrage conditions. So the fact that we've got these these uh, ratios which are high and have risen in trend suggests very strongly that there's something preventing arbitrage from working here. That's the barrier to, so there, you have to go to barriers to entry. Uh, 
We have time for one more question. Uh, my name, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, my name is Jim Gander. I'm emeritus in the econ department. I have to admit I probably forgot more of the theory than I'm going to allude to. But I think that all, three, all six or seven presenters did an excellent job. My main focus is on the behavior of uh, profit by one of the presenters. And, um, you know, econometricians can come up with all kinds of regressions that explain anywhere from maybe 10 percent to 30 or 40 or 50 percent of the variation in profit. Uh, but in terms of the underlying theory, in terms of our toolkit of underlying, underlying micro theory, it, um, it, it seems to be lacking when you consider different products. Admittedly, if you're looking at the demand for bananas, which is a trivial thing in terms of consumer spending, sure, you can find a price quantity relationship. But if you go to the pharmaceutical industry, for example, it doesn't apply. And we need a new approach, I think, to this. Um, I'll just give one example I've been studying. Pfizer Pharmaceutical Company recently came out with a new drug for amyloid doses, which is a protein that affects the heart muscle. And it's very prevalent throughout the country and throughout the world, for that matter. And so they were just recently approved. And so the walk-in price is $3,575 per, per, per month. Not, not day, not year, but per month. Now, they do have exceptions. They do have different, uh, what they call assistant plans and so on. Uh, but uh, the point is that it's pretty hard to come up with a supply and demand curve for that type of pr product. First of all, you know, with bananas, you can forget them today and wait for tomorrow, or wait for a week from now. Who cares? But with the uh, particular drug that they're selling, you can't do that because you may, be, you may not make it tomorrow. And so what I'm getting at is that the underlying micro theory behind much of what everybody's been presenting needs to be overhauled when you do it on a product by product basis. The information industry is another example. The price of information is important just millisecond. It has no value five milliseconds later. All you have to do is look at how the fast traders behave in the market and you can see this. And so, and, and these two products, pharmacy <coughs> and information, constitute maybe 60% of our spending. So my whole point is that we need a, a bigger toolkit. It doesn't seem like antitrust per se with the existing toolkit is going to get the issue for many, many different products. Thank you. Thanks so much. Anybody wants to? address that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think those are good points, and I think they uh, speak to the poverty of the existing antitrust toolkit and the very prescriptive assumptions that you get from uh, microeconomics that are, you know, sort of baked into the law in uh, misguided Supreme Court opinions in most cases, and, uh, you know, come to dominate and structure the markets in which they weren't even intended to apply. All right, so I'm going to let um, Mark uh, say the last words. Um, you don't want to respond to Jim? No. You said you wanted to. <laughs> I did, but it's too many questions went by. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, Ben, thank you um, to our discussants and to our panelists for a great presentation and great critique. And thank you for the audience for the participation.